One, two, three. Welcome to No Apologies, I'm Dana Lash. Well, as this Afghanistan disaster continues to unfold, I told you yesterday it was going to be interesting to watch how the administration responded to this with press. They'd probably like to hide under a rock at this point, but that's not possible. Apparently, unless you're Kamala Harris, because they've disappeared her. Uh, so what disposition would the administration have going forward in regards to this disaster? Now, I said that we could probably tell a lot by this George Stephanopoulos interview with the president that dropped, well, excerpts yesterday. And the interview aired this morning, highly edited, or as the left loves to say, deceptively edited, chopped up piecemeal segments. So in a nutshell, how did President Biden come off? Well, to be honest, I kind of felt like the president decided to just double down on disaster. The interview felt like a hit piece from conservative media, but it wasn't in some respects. I sort of got a WTF feel from George Stephanopoulos' expression, but it was very, very nicely produced and edited to make Biden look as positive as possible. I'd love to see the raw, unedited video. I think we all would. In fact, it was Biden's own words, though. And once again, the president deflected, abdicating, directing, redirecting all responsibility away from himself. So let's take a look at a little bit of this. Let's go through it. So first you have the president who said that no one is being killed outside the airport as far as he knows. The way that he made it sound during this discussion was that, no, 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 everything is under control, but that's not what we're seeing. This is his answer to Stephanopoulos on that watch. It took two days to take control of the airport. We have control of the airport now. Still a lot of pandemonium outside the airport. Well, there is, but look, but no one's being killed right now. God forgive me for if I'm wrong about that, but no one's being killed right now. People are, we got a thousand somewhere, 1,200 out yesterday, a couple thousand a day, and it's increasing. We're going to get those people out. Oh, this is so nuts. Here's some of the footage of actually what's happening right outside of the wall of the airport, Mr. President. Take a look at this. See, this is, this is what I'm talking about. This is what, by the Americans that are trying to get to the Hamid Karzai International Airport there in Kabul, they have to go through all of this to get to the North Gate, just to get inside of the airport. And it's all Taliban controlled. And we're not even showing you the video of the woman who was lying in a pool of blood because she was murdered by the Taliban because she didn't have her, didn't have her head covering on. And that's just what we're seeing on video. There's tons of other reports from journalists all over social media who are there, who are on the ground, who are saying the exact opposite of what the president is saying. So this is what I mean by doubling down on disaster. The president says that nobody's being killed outside. Oh, yeah, that's fine. It's, everything outside's fine, except actually that's exactly what's happening just outside of the airport. Why would he even say that? Why is that even a point? I mean, it's the Taliban. These are zealots who want to establish this emirate in Afghanistan, they, they're just, they just want to control everything. Listen to this account from Sky News. The quote is, day and night, said, listen, day and night, they said families often with tiny children have risked their lives ducking past gunfire at the gates of the civilian side of the airport. They say senior officials say they have no choice because the situation was out of control. They said that they were throwing babies over the razor wire, asking soldiers to take them. In fact, I just actually watched a video of a toddler being tossed over to some of the Marines standing on the wall. They said some got caught in the wire. The source said, I'm worried for my men. I'm counseling some. Everyone cried last night, end quote. Wow, a lot of desperation there. At this point, there's no getting away from it. There's no downplay in the situation. I'm not even sure why the president would try to run from it. I mean, we have this thing called the internet and all of this stuff exists on the internet. Now listen as Stephanopoulos pressed the president on just how this has been handled. So you don't think this could have been handled, this actually could have been handled better in any way? No mistakes? No, I, I, I don't think it could have been handled in a way that there, we, we're going to go back in hindsight and look, but the idea that somehow there's a way to have gotten out without chaos ensuing, I don't know how that happens. I don't know how that happened. So for you, that was always priced into the decision? Yes. I, I tell you, I have no words for this. I, I'm, I could tell you a lot of different ways that you could make that from not happening, where you could have prevented the chaos. The fact that they didn't secure any of the visas before announcing that they were going to close the air, the air base out in, out in Bagram or 
the fact that they did not have any accommodations, anything set ready to go for all of the informants and the interpreters and the Afghans that had actually worked with U.S. military forces in their objective with decentralizing the Taliban. And you realize that the Taliban, there were local reports of this already. Uh, there's, there's video, there's all kinds of reporting from, again, journalists and videographers on the ground in Kabul who are saying that the Taliban are now going door to door looking for all Afghan nationals that were working with U.S. military because they're executing them, they're killing them. So there's a lot of things that could have been done uh, leading up to this that would have prevented this chaos. So the president downplays any violence going outside the airport. He says that it couldn't have been handled any other way. And so it just honestly, it got worse from here on out. This was awkward to watch. Uh, it got awkward for the president, worse as it went on. And Stephanopoulos even reminded what the president said back on July 8th in no uncertain terms that the Taliban was not going to take over. Watch this. You didn't put a timeline out when you said it was highly unlikely. You just said flat out it's highly unlikely the Taliban would take over. Yeah. Well, the question was whether or not it, what, the idea that the Taliban would take over was premised on the notion that the, uh, that somehow the 300,000 troops we had trained and equipped was going to just collapse. They were going to give up. I don't think anybody anticipated that. You mean you couldn't when you withdrew their air support and even withdrew the contractors that worked on the, 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 the planes that they had and the helicopters that they had? You honestly could feel him searching for the words, how, trying to figure how he was going to answer this from Stephanopoulos. And honestly, he appeared foggy and muddled. He did not seem confident in his answers. They weren't concise. And on one hand, he says the pullout wasn't a failure. And on the other hand, he says that chaos was guaranteed. Uh, but on the other hand, there's really no chaos and there's really no killing outside of the airport. In fact, they're increasing the people that they're evacuating every single day. Uh, but they're not because half-empty planes have been going out. This was reported earlier today. And you've seen the violence, lots of it. I mean, all outside the airport, all over the map. And Stephanopoulos kept pressing. So if chaos is guaranteed, according to the president, then why such poor planning and complete lack of organization? Take a look. There was no good time to leave. But if there's no good time, if you know you're going to have to leave eventually, why not have the, everything in place to make sure Americans to get out, to make sure our Afghan allies get out, so we don't have these chaotic scenes in Kabul? Number one, as you know, the intelligence community did not say back in June or July that, in fact, this was going to collapse like it did. Number one. They thought the Taliban would take over, but not this quickly. But not this quickly, not even close. We took precautions. That's why I authorized that there be 6,000 American troops to flow in to accommodate this exit, number one. And number two, provided all that aircraft in the Gulf to get people out. We pre-positioned all of that, anticipated that. He's trying to blame this on intelligence and intelligence is going to turn this right back around because numerous reports say yes, in fact, they were warning him that this was going to happen. You've had the State Department and you also have the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on completely different pages on this issue. Uh, this is insane. No, they just, this was just, it was half-assed. They didn't take any precautions. That's the whole point. It was pure chaos. And we know this because, again, here's Democrat-friendly CNN. Clarissa Ward, by the way, has done a fabulous job on reporting on the ground in Kabul. She had this to say about the insanity outside of the airport and really the responsibility of this chaos. Listen to this. It's the panic, the lack of clear information. The rumor mill is in overdrive. There's hysteria. You have Taliban fighters with whips, with guns. You have US and UK soldiers who are not allowing people in. You have mixed messaging coming through about what kind of paperwork you need and how you can get on a flight and where you can go. I mean, it is just an absolute mess. And we heard President Biden say yesterday in his uh, comments to ABC News that this is not a failure. And I think a lot of people outside that airport, particularly those taking the kinds of extreme actions we're just talking about, would like to know if this isn't failure, what does failure look like exactly? That's CNN, by the way. Now, to underscore this lack of preparation, this is Defense Department spokesman John Kirby. As of today, how many Americans, uh, American citizens remain in, in Afghanistan? I don't know. Of the 2,000 um, uh, over the last 24 hours, I, I think uh, nearly 300 of them were uh, uh, Americans. Acknowledging that, yeah, they really don't even know how many Americans are in Afghanistan. This is all pretty insane. 
Uh, he says that they have no idea. De the Defense Department has no clue who is there. You can't know who you've got left to rescue, obviously, if you don't even know who's in the country. What gets me is that, and I, this was a really great point that was made uh, by someone earlier today, in that we know the names of like all of these people who even just showed up, for instance, at the Capitol on January 6th and were going to food trucks, but we don't have a list of the Americans who were in Kabul. That's indefensible. I mean, this is a disastrous lack of planning and people are paying for it with their lives. But the president, he's trying to pretend that it is not an abject failure on every level. Listen to this. But we've all seen the pictures. We've seen those hundreds of people packed into a C-17. We've seen Afghans falling. That was four days ago, five days ago. Well, at least Stephanopoulos is asking the questions. And you can see Biden doesn't like it. He snaps at him at a couple of different points. And he seemed, he seemed just very antagonistic, very you know, belligerent. I saw a little bit of the old Joe in that interview. See, one of the problems with this administration, particularly Democrat administrations, is when you have a Democrat president, usually the reporters, are, and there have been surveys done on this, how the majority of journalists lean left and identify as Democrats. And as a result, very few of them ask the tough questions that are required in this republic, especially with the media that is supposed to be holding them to account for the citizenry. Instead, they're sycophantic. The media runs cover for them almost all the time. And you can actually feel the disdain from Biden when Stephanopoulos pins him down and asks him about the people who fell from that C-17 from the sky. And of course, the president just sort of shrugs it off. I mean, what he's saying is, George, move on. You know, we've gotten past that. I don't think so. Not the families who lost those, those individuals. So these images, I mean, he's, he's annoyed. He's annoyed that Stephanopoulos is bringing them up. And he gets incredibly indignant when the press does its job because he's not used to it. Democrats aren't used to that. But unfortunately for Biden, these images are emerging more and more that really paint a picture of a Taliban takeover that can't be minimized or rationalized. And yet that's exactly what he tries to do. And you see this in media. I mean, the excuses and the diversion and the deflections, the, the insistency on trying to pin it on the previous administration when it was the Biden administration that was the one that set the September timeline. No one in their right mind was going to set a 9-11 optic timeline. And by the way, the Trump administration too, uh, Wall Street Journal had noted in a recent piece, they actually, the, the Trump administration was going to wait for the fall harvest season, when you have the Taliban that go out and they oversee the harvesting of the poppies because they have a huge heroin cash crop there. And that's when the fighting season is done. And then, of course, everyone then goes up northern in the mountains towards Pakistan and where they lay low all winter, then they come back, sow the fields for spring, and then they resume fighting. That has been clockwork for as long as, I mean, I've, I can remember military strategists talking about this on news for years. I mean, this is how they set, they set the schedule by this. And for some reason, Biden didn't want to wait for that. Trump listened to the military advisors and did. Of course, he also ceased any kind of negotiation with Taliban after Taliban admitted that to that terrorist attack. What are you going to do? You can't, you're not going to, you're not going to win a conflict and export Republican principles and a democratic process to a country that has a bunch of different tribal groups and clans organized under a Muslim faith. It's not going to happen. That hasn't, that's, no, Afghanistan has never operated that way. I tell you, a Taliban that believes in rights for women within Sharia law, of course. This is something that also Biden was asked about. And there's been a lot of, well, I think the spin, the attempt to spin this has stopped. Yeah, the Taliban's not gonna be some kind of social justice loving Taliban. These are not people who are gonna announce their preferred pronouns at the start of their meetings. They're not gonna sit here and tell you about their truth. But yet here's Biden trying to talk about how the Taliban, you know, the kinder, gentler Taliban, they might cooperate because they want to maintain their international image. Watch. Now in Afghanistan, do you believe the Taliban have changed? No. I think, let me put it this way, I think they're going through sort of an existential crisis about do they want to be recognized by the international community as being a legitimate government? I'm not sure they do. But look, they have... They, they care about their beliefs more. Well, they do. But they also care about whether they have food to eat, whether they have an income that can make any money and run an economy. They care about whether or not they can hold together the society that they, in fact, say they care so much about. I'm not counting on any of that, but that is part of what I think is going on right now in terms of, I, I'm not sure I would have predicted, George, nor would you or anyone else, that when we decided to leave, that they provide safe passage for Americans to get out. 
See, here's the thing about the Taliban. This isn't a John Hughes movie, and although that's what President Biden tries to make it sound like. He tries to make it sound like this is a coming-of-age group and a coming-of-age story. They're going to do whatever is advantageous to themselves. Remember, these Mujahideen fighters, they're going to work with absolutely anybody. And back in the day, the U.S. armed Afghan fighters with Stinger missiles to fight against the Soviet Union in a proxy battle. Remember all of this? And now those same missiles have fallen into the hands of zealots who are busy working with al-Qaeda to take down the World Trade Center by giving them well, letting them use Afghanistan as their headquarters, not just for training camps, but to carry out all of their missions. Taliban isn't loyal to anyone except the Taliban, so don't be sure that they need the West at all. That's such a myopic viewpoint. Oh my heavens. And they don't care what the West thinks of them. They don't care about their seat at the international table. But the Taliban may, only because it might benefit them, they may, may, as many asterisks here, work with China. Communist China, of course they've cozied up to the Taliban. And they would do this because China continues to try to get, well, first you have the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative that they've been trying to implement in numerous African countries, and they would love to do something like this with Afghanistan, because Afghanistan, according to an internal memo with the Pentagon back during the Obama era, Afghanistan is the Saudi Arabia of lithium. Afghanistan has tons of natural resources, massive lithium deposits, and guess who shares a little smidgen border with them? And we'd love to get their hands on that lithium, the Communist Chinese Party. And then they can hold the world hostage since they control the supply of these critical minerals. Right at the time that G7 is telling everyone to get rid of the combustible engine and everybody just go to electric cars, even though electricity is still by and large produced in more than 86% of its producing coal powered plants. But that's irrelevant, right? Everyone needs lithium. Powers your phones, powers your electric cars. In any case, there will be no new and improved, nicer, softer Taliban. We're going to talk more about the China connection there and what that means for the G7's agenda more next week. But in terms of women's quote unquote rights, I can't even believe anybody's saying that with a straight face in context of Taliban. I mean, they're, already, they're literally erasing women from storefronts and public, public places. Take a look at this. Actually covering them up. Pretty unbelievable. No, this is the kinder, gentler Taliban. There's no new Taliban. And everyone who's reported from Afghanistan corroborates this. So it's an unmitigated disaster. It is an absolute geopolitical embarrassment. This is going to forever define Joe Biden. It's going to forever define this administration. And he just used what should have been, if his people were smart, they were trying to rehabilitate him with this interview. He just doubled down on every dumb point. He's not owning this at all. I mean, yesterday, no, no discussion as to how many Americans might be left behind. We have thousands of Americans over in Kabul right now, and the United States doesn't know anything about that. They say that they have no idea they couldn't have predicted any of this 11 days out, except for the fact that the Taliban were just talking about it on WhatsApp and they were just bragging about it. I, they used WhatsApp for the second time now to actually take over, take over uh, geographical areas. But no, everyone was too busy in this administration watching Facebook and Twitter for COVID wrong think. No, Biden knew. He was told this was going to be a disaster. And that's essentially what he's saying. He's, he's, he's not, good heavens, saying that there was no other possibility except for chaos. Hmm. And the truth is, honestly, we shouldn't really, we shouldn't be here. Everyone agrees that a withdrawal was needed. It was going to happen regardless. But after that, the way to do it, that was up to this administration. They were the ones who set the date. They were the ones who went to September and then decided now. They were the ones who decided to close Bagram. They were the ones who decided to not situate all the visas and everything else in order to, uh, to get everyone out and evacuate all Americans and Afghan assets safely. Now they have to actually literally negotiate with the Taliban for the safety of Americans, for safe passage. This is, I mean, honestly, it's kind of in some ways comes off like this massive hostage negotiation. And that really is kind of what it is. Although I think we're, depending on how long this drags out, I really don't think that the Taliban is going to be very welcoming after a couple of weeks of Americans trying to control them to get other people out. Now, it could actually very well end up being like a 1979 Tehran sort of situation. I mean, at this point, how do you get the Taliban to do anything? They're in control. You lost your leverage. The time to negotiate with them was before you pulled out and lost control of the country. That's what Trump was doing. And you can love him or hate him, but he had a hand to play then, and now we don't. So the Taliban are holding all the cards, and you're going to have to offer some kind of carrot. Otherwise, you're going to be looking at thousands of Americans who might not get out of Kabul. That's called doubling down on disaster, and that's exactly what Biden did here. And now he's having to re-engage our military on a much bigger scale in Afghanistan, which means we had no exit plan from this administration. And for a guy who says that he doesn't want to send our sons and daughters to war, he sure as hell committed 7,000 of them to do just that, didn't he? Putting thousands of American lives in harm's way.
Yes. That's going to necessitate that we have to go back in. That's the new strategy from the Biden administration. So coming up, how is the administration going to be held accountable for this massive failure on the ground in Afghanistan? And what are members of Congress doing to make sure that they get people out? We'll catch up on all of this with House Minority Whip Steve Scalise on the other side. Stick with us. Every morning, the first publishes an email called Up First, where they curate the day's news, the best videos, and must-see moments that everyone's talking about. So if you're not getting this email, you're missing out. Visit thefirsttv.com to sign up for free today. Welcome back to No Apologies. What we're seeing in Afghanistan is unlike anything that, oh, I've never seen anything like this, to be honest. A lot of people have pointed to the fall of Saigon, but at this point, it's worse than that. So what is next? How are we going to evacuate all of these Americans? How are we going to get out Afghan assets? Are, how, how are we going to deal with China? President Biden and the military brass, will any of them be held accountable for this failure? House Minority Whip Steve Scalise may have an idea. He joins us now. Congressman, thank you for being here and giving us some of your time today. We appreciate it. Good to see you. Yeah, good to be with you. Thanks. So I, I have to ask you this question about evacuation flights. And I know that U.S. law, they, you know, there's certain things that the U.S. is required to do. But this is after you know, we were hearing the president talk about evacuating Americans, how he didn't really think that there was going to, he thought chaos was the only option. Of course, you heard from Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. You heard from you know, uh, General Mark Milley. And now the reports are that there's some, some Americans are being charged for these evacuation flights to even to even depart and I'm my head is spinning as I'm sure yours is because here we didn't have anything situated no visas no nothing to get everyone out and now they're being surprised at the last minute after Kabul has fallen and if they're able to be lucky enough to make it to that airport there congressman in Kabul now some of them are being charged up to two thousand dollars according to uh, NatSec Daily uh, in order to be able to get out of the country what what can you tell us about this and I know you and others are working hard to help this evacuation process what what light can you shed on it you know, right now, me and a lot of my colleagues are focused on helping Americans and our allies, the translators who are helping our troops to help them get out. But uh, first of all, for President Biden today to say chaos was inevitable and was expected, it's flat out just not true because he was saying something very different two weeks ago. Does he forget that he was saying this wasn't going to be like Saigon with people, you know, helicopters evacuating the embassy? Uh, he said that just a few weeks ago, and it, and it was dead wrong. In fact. We saw the helicopters evacuating the embassy. You're right. It is worse than Saigon, maybe worse than Saigon and the Bay of Pigs. But it was completely predictable. The experts were saying if they pulled out too early, this would happen. And while things were under control, while we hadn't had a loss of life in a year and a half, if President Biden wanted to pull everybody out, he had the ability to plan it out so that you could get the Americans out before the Taliban took control of the country. It was completely avoidable. For him to say chaos was inevitable is flat out inaccurate. It's a complete and epic failure of President Biden's foreign policy. Many Democrats are saying this too. Uh, it's, it's very, very frustrating. It angers people who serve. I talked to a, a, a mom who lost her son in Afghanistan a few years ago from my district. And, and these families are heartbroken. Uh, and people who have friends behind enemy lines are heartbroken because it was completely avoidable. Every single ounce of focus of President Biden's right now needs to be getting these Americans out. But at some point, he's going to have to come clean the American people. Two weeks ago, he said this wasn't going to happen. And today, he's saying, of course, it was going to happen. Uh, that's not, those two don't mesh. No, they don't at all. We're talking with Congressman Steve Scalise. They, yeah, they, they don't at all. And then we're, we're hearing, too, that uh, from the press conference yesterday, and it was a stunning moment because Lloyd Austin was asked by one reporter if they're actually dependent upon diplomacy with the Taliban to get Americans who are outside of the airport to the airport safely. And then, of course, we see the video of all the chaos outside of the airport. And then today, hearing reports of these planes that are leaving half full. So clearly, they're not able to go out. We heard, we heard Lloyd Austin say this. We can't just, the United States can't go out and just bring giant groups of people back to the, back to, uh, the airport there. What, are, what is your thought on this? Because it sounds like there are a lot of Americans not at the airport that aren't going to be able to get there anytime soon. Yeah, and we're still not getting clear answers from the Biden administration. You know, when we've asked how many Americans are behind. And lines, you're in Congress, they and they're not telling right, you. Do they have a list of the interpreters? We had been working for months to get the interpreters out, and there are some reports that they may have shredded the list when they were just having this fire sale to evacuate the embassy. When Again, this could have been planned. 
Uh, it could have been planned where you had weeks in advance to get everybody out before they let the Taliban run roughshod over the country, which they've done. Uh, but, you know, days ago, just two days ago, you had people falling off of airplanes because they were so over full. And then today there, there's empty mm. uh, seats on the airplane. I mean, this is complete and utter failure and mismanagement. Is Biden going to clean house? Uh, if, if it wasn't him, I mean, he said the buck stops here and then he went on blaming everybody but himself for what happened. This falls on President Biden and Kamala Harris. They made this call. Kamala Harris bragged that she was the last one in the room. To, I mean, my God, was anybody saying this is the, the maybe the dumbest, craziest way to approach it? Uh, and now, now our allies around the world are, are just livid themselves. Look at Britain today. Mm. Uh, Britain admonished President Biden by name, uh, especially for him bashing and blaming the Afghan army. Uh, these were people we were working side by side with who told us they were not ready for America to pull out. And he pulled out anyway, and then he blames them. Uh, our allies around the world who we're going to have to partner with on other things are watching this. And as we know, our enemies are watching this too. You know, China is looking right down at Taiwan. Russia's looking at Ukraine. What's uh, Iran thinking? What's Pakistan thinking when they've got nuclear weapons and right next door now, they have a terrorist organization running the country. Uh, and we have a poor southern border where we know people have come across that are on the terrorist watch list before Afghanistan fell to the Taliban. What's he gonna do now? What's President Biden gonna do now to protect America? Because we're on the heels of the September 11th, uh, 20th anniversary. We haven't had an attack on our homeland in 20 years, thank God, in part because of the bravery of our men and women in uniform and the fact that we were fighting the terrorists across the, the globe in their countries. Uh, they're gonna wanna come back here mm. to America. What's President Biden doing to keep America safe? Uh, this is a total and epic failure. I, I, Congressman Steve Scalise on, on, on this issue, do you worry, you mentioned 9-11 coming up, and I can't imagine that the Taliban, for the lack of a better way to put it, hospitality, we'll call it that, I can't imagine that that's going to extend for that long. Are you worried that there's going to be, I mean, a hostage situation at this point, depending on, on how this goes, and, and, and reminiscent of 1979 in Tehran, and, and would the administration, from everything that you've seen, from them answering and fielding questions about this and explaining uh, their moves, do you, are, do you have confidence that they would be able to make the decisions to get us out of this? Well, I, I hope and pray that doesn't happen. But the fact that President Biden is, is not just hoping, but he's begging the Taliban uh, not to do that when he could have gotten all of those Americans out. He could have gotten all those translators yeah. out before he evacuated the city. He chose the date. Again, we hadn't had a loss of life in a year and a half. Uh, he completely wow. chose to do this on his own. It's a it's a disaster for American foreign policy, all on President Biden's hands. Mm. Last question for you, Congressman. Where is the president? Where is he? He's he's only he only talked about COVID just the other day, and the only answers that he has given anybody were, were with uh, George Stephanopoulos on ABC this morning. Right. Only one interview. He won't take questions from the mainstream press. The press is furious because he left who knows how many. Uh, members of the press behind enemy lines. Uh, in fact, a lot of American members of the press that he left behind enemy lines. Uh, I don't know how he, he doesn't clean house, how he doesn't completely change mm. course, but unfortunately he's been wrong on so many other areas. You know, General Gates's quote from years ago where he said President Biden has been wrong on foreign policy for over 40 years. Uh, it's sad to see this happening uh, right now to our country and to our friends mm. around the world and those people in Afghanistan. Very much so. It's just heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to watch this, and I hope that we can get all of these people out. I can't imagine how difficult it would be to have uh, allies and aides and informants and interpreters in, in other theaters in the future, considering this is, what, this is what we do to them, apparently, under this administration. Congressman Steve Scalise, thank you so much for all you do, and appreciate all your hard work on this. Good to see you. Thanks. Great to be with you. Of course. Folks, up next, what if I told you that China, Afghanistan, and COVID were all connected? It's true. Red State's Scott Hounsel is going to explain it all coming up next. Stay with us. Black Rifle Coffee Company is a veteran-owned coffee company, and they proudly serve premium coffee to people who love America. Veteran CEO and founder Evan Hafer spent over seven years on the ground overseas with U.S. Special Forces and as a CAA contractor. Black Rifle Coffee is committed to Evan's mission of supporting veteran, law enforcement, and first responder causes. So this August, Black Rifle Coffee Company invites you to take in the moments that are served alongside that fresh cup of coffee. Because they understand that it's really about the people that you enjoy it with, mostly, and the adventures that are inspired by it. 
So wherever this August takes you, Black Rifle Coffee is there to fuel your way. Their high-quality coffee beans are imported from all over the world. They're roasted five days a week in Tennessee and Utah. It's where they have their facilities. So order yours today and head on over to blackriflecoffee.com slash DanaTV. Use code DanaTV at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. End your summer with America's Coffee, Black Rifle Coffee. Welcome back to No Apologies. We've been pretty focused on Afghanistan because it's a huge story. That and the Taliban and any kind of potential work with the Communist Chinese Party, it's going to have repercussions that affect more than just headlines this week. We reported earlier that they've, embold they've been emboldened in their actions, the CCP against Taiwan. Things could get a whole lot worse. Red State's Scott Hounsel has been on the case. He's been writing about this. He's here with us to report the very latest. Scott, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Of course, it's, and, I, and I've really appreciated your, your writings on this. You've been writing about this over at Red State and elsewhere, and of course on social media as well. This is, I mean, every single gift it seems like that, has, that could have been gifted to uh, Beijing has been done so uh, with this move from Joe Biden. And I, I look at, I mean, we've been talking about the Taliban and how uh, the kinder, gentler Taliban, that kind of spin has sort of failed. Uh, and I'm not really sure why they wanted to rehabilitate them in that way. But what gets me is that here, you know, we have Biden after G7 and all of this discussion with moving all of our vehicles to green energy and taking all of the, air, the airline industry, making the, that all run on green energy. But yet here you have Afghanistan that was considered by this Pentagon memo about 10 years ago to be the Saudi Arabia of lithium. And you have the CCP who is eager. They are calling the Taliban their friends. They're all about working with them. That kind of makes this decision by Biden seem all the crazier. What, what, are, what is your take on this and, and what have you been reporting on with, in regards to this issue? Well, obviously the Chinese government is no friend of the United States interests or United States government, and they will continually fight against those, those interests that we have. We've been talking about this issue uh, with, with, uh, with COVID-19, with the uh, lab leak theory, with the influence they've had over the WHO. They are no friends of ours. Additionally, uh, during, the, during 2019, I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to study in Africa uh, while I was getting my MBA from George Washington University. And one of the things I noticed is a Chinese influence in the mineral resources within Africa. Uh, so often, Africa is one of the most rich, con rich continents when it comes to mineral resources. And the Chinese influence there is insane. They've, they've, they've taken over railroads and they've taken over ports and they've taken over all the means of being able to get to these mineral resources. So it really is no surprise that that uh, the Chinese are interested in the lithium, especially as we move towards an electrified card systems, uh, that, that this lithium, this huge lithium uh, deposit is of interest to them. What, and, but it also shouldn't be any surprise that Joe Biden rolls over and shows the pink underbelly to the Chinese because he's done it consistently to protect his son. Yeah, and that's oh my goodness, and and the this I mean this past I don't know past three days have just been insane. Why we were just recapping the interview that he did with George Stephanopoulos, and I was amazed that that question didn't come up, or maybe it did, and it was just omitted by ABC uh, because the whole thing was, as they like to say, deceptively edited, uh, so so parsed together. Uh, but that is, I mean, this I don't know why anyone would allow why why anyone whether it's Mark Milley or whether it's Lloyd Austin would think that this is a good position to be in. And I, and I can't imagine that there what, weren't any objections from those departments to the, uh, to the President of the United States or within the cabinet, especially considering the disaster with China and Wuhan and the lab leak and coronavirus and everything it did to not just our economy but to the world. Uh, they really seem behind the ball. Is it because there's just been this overwhelming focus on the Middle East all of these years? And so everybody's, you know, especially this administration kind of turning its back on what happened in the, uh, going, what's going on in the Pacific? I think that it, it's, it's multiple fold. I mean, if we look at the fact that the United States government has been rolling over the Chinese for years, I mean, we talk about in, in October of last year, Jennifer Van Lahr and I were re reported on a lot of the business dealings that, that Hunter Biden was involved in. Hennages, which is a, uh, a, an auto manufacturer in the United States, which provided uh, anti-vibration technology for the, J J or the F-35 uh, Joint Strike Fighter, our F-35 program, uh, was bought out by AVIC, a Chinese military agency uh, that is basically their Boeing, uh, but it's obviously state-owned. They, uh, they make all of their fighters and everything else over there. 
they bought Heneges in 2015. This was approved by the Obama administration. They knew that they were selling classified material, classified information to the Chinese. Why they continue to roll over to them, why they continue to uh, placate them, why they continue to allow them to purchase uh, American resources and threaten American national security is beyond me. I, I don't know how everyone isn't pointing the finger at China now and saying they're responsible for the deaths of over 4 million people around the world over the course of the last year. Look what we did to countries that have had done have done similar things in the past. Why aren't we asking for the same level of responsibility from China? It's beyond me. And I can imagine, Scott, too, that instead of having more sanctions go towards China because of uh, whatever we discover, if we're ever actually able, or this administration shows an interest in getting to the bottom of how this pandemic became what it was, uh, considering our tax dollars went towards the lab that was apparently studying gain of function that that uh, that uh, Anthony Fauci was denying. But what gets me is it seems like we're going to move if if this is the if this is the trajectory if this continues and the Chinese are able to make a deal with the kinder, gentler Taliban as I know that Democrats would like to present them as. It seems like then we would be in we would have to do business with them instead of levying sanctions on them at this point. Your thought? Yeah, you know, obviously I was not a huge fan of the idea of negotiating with the Taliban, but at least to get something out of them or some sort of guarantees in response to Trump's uh, Trump's uh, offer for peace with the Taliban. Uh, but the fact that we got nothing out of it and we we had the the images of people falling off the bottom of American American uh, aircraft as they're taking off out of Kabul, uh, all the things that we've been seeing uh, that, that are coming out of this is not, it, it doesn't honor the, the sacrifice Americans made to provide the peace and security of the country. Uh, the idea that we were ever going to fully pull out of Afghanistan was kind of a misnomer. We're still in Japan, we're still in yeah. Germany, we're still in Korea. We yeah. have been in all these places for years and decades. The fact that we were going to pull out 100%, yes, we could have ceased all military operations, which we did during the Obama administration. Yes, we could have reduced troop levels to a very basic amount, but we should have never pulled out, removed all staff, because that removed security with it. It removed the the stick yeah. to the carrot. And we're and now we're dealing with the with the fallout of now watching these images of of Taliban fighters, you know, threatening the people that we worked so hard to defend for so long. I, I'm amazed, too. We're talking with Scott Hounsel of RedState.com. I'm amazed at some of the gear that these guys got that they were able to. I saw some images earlier of just the haul they were able to take from, from the base. And, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at, I saw somebody walking around with a scar. I saw somebody walking around with, like, an optic that I know runs for, like, you know, 4 to 5K. I'm looking at this stuff thinking, you know, th this isn't, we this is, we paid for this stuff. And they're walking around with, like, like all, I mean, and I'm not even getting into the aircraft, not even getting into the, armored vehicles that our tax dollars went towards, uh, which I'm sure that we're not going to be nice if we could get a tax break on that. One last question for you, Scott, in that in that realm. With the Obama-Biden Fast and Furious, and this is just me kind of spitballing, why couldn't he just revive the Fast and Furious program, run some guns up to people in the Xinjiang province? I mean, there's a little bit there that kind of goes down, you know, by uh, Tajikistan next to, next to Afghanistan. And, and maybe see if the Taliban would be interested in, in maybe carrying out attacks against China as, as a way to, to get back to, uh, for those detention camps. I'm just, again, just totally spitballing. If they were going to have a gun running program, it seems like that would be the way to do it. Right. You know, but of, of course, we have a problem with our guns here in the United States, but they have no problem with literally handing over tens of thousands of weapons to the Taliban. Uh, you know, it's it's really frustrating to me. Obviously, that would be a, a a plan. But again, this goes back to the libertarian side of me. Do we need to be in? Do we need to be arming insurgents? Many of the weapons that we mm. were used against us in Afghanistan in the early 2000s were weapons that we had given to them to fight against the Russians in the late 70s and early 80s. Yep. So I, I, now we have what I'm more concerned with with the Afghanistan area and everything else is the fact that we've now created the next generation of terrorists. How many of these people, oh. these families of these in, of these of these interpreters, who've now watched them be uh, be beaten and murdered by the Taliban for helping the United States? How many of their children are willing to help the United States in the future? How many of them won't turn and and become fighters against the United States as a result? This is this is not just a problem now. It's going to be a problem ten years from now. It's going to be a problem twenty years from now. This is not just oh, we're pulling out because we, we lost or any of the rest of it. This was a complete decentralization of power and, and creating a power vacuum, which now 
is going to be filled by Russian and Chinese interests. And it's, that is not anything good for the United States. You bring up a really good point, Scott. And I think it also just pretty much destroys recruitment, at least for the next generation for the U.S. military after seeing this. Good heavens. Scott Hounsel with RedState.com. Scott, great take. Good to see you. Thanks so much for what you do. Thank you so much. Of course. All right, folks, coming up, if you thought the Taliban being on Twitter is bad, wait until you hear about how they used another American big tech company to help take over Afghanistan. I'm not even exaggerating. We'll catch up to speed on this coming up. Well, when asked if he saw the complete takeover of, of Afghanistan coming, General Milley put down his Ibram X. Kendi book and said this. However, the time frame of a rapid collapse, that was widely estimated and ranged from weeks to months and even years following our departure. There was nothing that I or anyone else saw that indicated a collapse of this army and this government in 11 days. Really? Is that what you want to go with, General Milley? You didn't see the Taliban takeover coming? I mean, you didn't know that there's an app for that, literally. It's called WhatsApp. It's on the App Store. You can find out what the Taliban's next move is going to be. It's, if it sounds crazy, it's because it's crazy. It's crazy to think that for a long time, the Taliban has actually been using WhatsApp to organize and coordinate their efforts to kill and maim people and organize some good old-fashioned jihad and oppress some women, all with the goal of one day establishing this new, what is it, their Taliban emirate. It's not easy being, you know, pulling off Islamic jihadism, I guess. But WhatsApp's super cool interface and its ability to centralize all their communication needs, orchestrating a Taliban takeover has never been easier. And I'm not joking, by the way. Taliban's been using WhatsApp for a long time. And we've known this for a long time. Maybe if General Milley, I don't know, read reporting like the New York Times, the big old piece they did on it in 2019. Vice also did a piece on this. Reuters also did a piece on this. Everyone read them, except for General Milley and our intelligence agencies, apparently. What were you all doing? It's enough to give somebody white rage, starting with General Milley. Now, when America goes to war, knocking out the enemy's communications is one of the first things you do. And if the enemy can't communicate, then they can't organize and they can't win. So did we ever bother shutting down the American-owned by Facebook WhatsApp communications channel? No. In fact, the Taliban is on Twitter. Did you know that? Yeah. And then the sitting president of the United States of America couldn't tweet. No, Twitter wouldn't let him. Tw Twitter would not let a sitting president tweet, suspended him. But the Taliban can. Think about that. So can the CCP. Think about all of the corporate censorship being directed at Americans by big tech right now. And think about how the Taliban used WhatsApp again, owned by Facebook, to coordinate a takeover of Afghanistan. And you wonder how the fall of Afghanistan happened so fast and so smoothly. Well, it's because they were using WhatsApp to help facilitate the, fall, the, the full surrender of the members of the Afghan army, the Ghani regime. They were asking them outright, giving them phone numbers to even call. Preston Byrne and others explained how the Taliban utilized the WhatsApp, the, the WhatsApp app better than a group of high schoolers could. He says, quote, imagine if the U.S. were in the throes of state failure and you received a personal message from your local Antifa, Proud Boy, or whatever branch right on your cell phone explaining there would be a nationwide offensive following which your boogeyman of choice backed by millions of supporters would install a totalitarian regime. And imagine they offered you the chance to surrender ahead of time. And then one day the proposed offensive happens with boogeyman Zerg rushing the state everywhere at once. How would you feel? What would you do if your leadership showed even the slightest weakness in the face of this assault? Their public statements limited to sophomore, sophomore platitudes about pluralism. Would you surrender? Would you run? Would you fight? Most people I know would surrender or run. And this explains, may explain why Afghan divisions cut bait and thousands of people in Kabul who could pick up rifles and fight, and if they chose to do so, would present a substantial obstacle to the Taliban closing in on the city. They didn't, they chose to flee instead, end quote. There were a lot of people actually wondering, too, a lot of local reporters, why is it that it was almost like it was expected that the Taliban were going to roll in? Hmm. So see, the media knew that Taliban was using WhatsApp to communicate and coordinate. Big tech knew. The Taliban knew. But our intelligence agencies, which are going after your grandma if she went to the January 6th thing just to hear Trump speak and didn't actually go into the Capitol, they, 
They know what she did, but they don't know what was going on here. I mean, if you think wrong things on Facebook, then Jen Psaki and the Biden administration and everyone else might come down on you to have those companies censor your post. Fire every single one of these people, every last one. We couldn't even bother to have Silicon Valley, who seems to really enjoy going after free, diverse speech in America. They wouldn't even shut down the Taliban. Although I will say, WhatsApp did shut down two Taliban accounts because they were trying to, uh, well, I guess they caught them, I guess. I don't know. They shut down two accounts. That's all I do know. But really, the, this just gets, the more we learn about this and how this happened, the worse it gets. Another disastrous oversight from our intel agencies, from big tech, and from an administration. They're more intent on watching us than watching actual terrorists, right? Not even interested in stopping radical Islamists use tech platforms to take over an entire country while thousands of Americans are still there. That does it for us tonight. Thanks for tuning in. Good night and don't bend the knee.